You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Estella. And I'm Sarah. And this is episode 218. Today's podcast is brought to you by HitItBoard.com. HitItBoard.com has the innovative training tools you need for agility. Having problems with the dog walker A-frame? The HitItBoard can fix that. Your dog doesn't like tugging? They'll love to tug it. Can't move your A-frame around by yourself? The Move It can. Go to HitItBoard.com and use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's HitItBoard.com. Today's podcast is also brought to you by 1TDC. Dog agility can be hard on your dog's body. Help keep their joints and muscles healthy with 1TDC. 1-tetradecanol complex is a clinically studied blend of unique fatty acid oils that can support your dog's joint health. 1TDC promotes a healthy inflammatory response from head to tail. All of our listeners will automatically qualify for a great 1TDC special offer by purchasing online at BDA1TDC.com. That's BDA, the number one, TDC.com. Today, we're going to be talking all about puppies, and we've asked Sarah Baker back onto the podcast. We recently talked to her after her AKC National Agility Championship win, her third win with Hops, and now we have her back to talk all about puppies because Sarah has just put out a brand new course on puppy raising uh, through the Bad Dog Agility Academy, and Esteban and I have just gotten a puppy, so we cannot stop thinking about puppies. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So uh, welcome, Sarah, and thank you for joining us. Hi, everybody, and thank you for having me. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to uh, start with is the obvious, right? Having a puppy is a really new and exciting time, and I think it's because you have that fresh slate experience, right? Nothing bad has happened yet, right? No no dream has been uh, not achieved, right? And we have a lot of goals and uh, hopes for our dogs. It's really a happy time. It's like the uh, honeymoon period in almost any relationship you have. So Sarah, tell us a little bit about having expectations uh, for a puppy. Uh, When you put together this course, well, actually, before we even talk about that, I want to hear a little bit more about your puppy. So everybody is very familiar with Hops. We did an awesome webinar, and everyone who went to that webinar learned a lot about Skeptic, your new puppy. But for those people who uh, weren't able to attend the webinar, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with uh, Skeptic? Well, Skeptic is an adorable English Cocker Spaniel who has been the biggest challenge I have had with a puppy. Um, he he was very difficult to get to focus for long periods of time. He didn't seem to to care about us quite as as much as your average puppy does for their their new um, owners. Um, he did a a ton of biting. Um, he'd get very frustrated very easily. So he we we had a lot of fun with him, but he was a big challenge, and I had to rethink my training many many times with him. Man, I was listening to her talk and all I could think was, oh, thank goodness, because it sounded like she was describing a lot of the aspects of our puppy, the <laughs> biting and the concentration and, and all right, that kind right. of stuff. Right, right. There's a lot of good and bad here. It's bad because everybody listening who is getting a puppy or about to get a puppy or just got a puppy, they're all like, oh, you know, this is kind of, this is kind of a downer. It's like a buzzkill. But then um, it's good and it's mostly good because – you have worked through this and uh, through your online course, obviously you've laid down a blueprint for people to follow people like me. So I got to do a lot of the editing for this course for Sarah. And so of course I watched every single video. There's like 38 videos, six and a half hours of footage. I read all the, you put together a daily journal, right? Where you you had very detailed notes about what you were doing. And um, I got to look at all of that. And then basically it was doing a whole puppy course for myself before I even got the puppy. Right. And then uh, I think this is our third week with the puppy. So this was all about two weeks ago uh, that I had finished that editing process. And of course, now we've launched that course. And so uh, it made me feel a lot better because I think if I didn't have that course, I would have super unrealistic expectations of what a puppy can do. It's been a long time since I've had a puppy that young. Uh, we've worked with several dogs over the past couple of years, uh, you know, training them for people, evaluating them for people, but they all tended to be adults. Or at the youngest, right, they were like six months, right? And they're already well outside of um, what I would consider, you know, early puppyhood. 
Well, and Hop spoiled me. Hops came ready to work, ready to focus, was was hardly ever distracted by anything. So this puppy threw me for a loop in the beginning. <laughs> right. And that's such a such an interesting thing because I think when I look around out there in the agility world, people who are writing articles, people who are teaching and doing courses and things like that, they have dogs that are more like hops than they are like skeptic. Okay, first just look at the breed choice, right? Hops, border collie. Famous father, right? The yes. national agility champion. And um, top trainers are going to get the top dogs, the top picks from the top breedings in order to give themselves the best possible chance to do well at agility, right? And obviously with hops that worked out. And then you have dogs like Skeptic, right? So that breed, although it's rising in popularity, especially mm-hmm. in UK, right? Is not a very well-known breed here in the United States, certainly, right? Correct. No one's gonna, if you say, oh, what, what are the most common small and medium dogs? No one's going to say working English, Cocker, Spaniel. Yes. <laughs> right? And so that's another thing that I really like because a lot of you people out there listening right now are going to have dogs that relate a little more to skeptic than they do to hops, even for a lot of border collie owners out there, right? And so let's talk about now those expectations because whether or not you are successful by whatever standard you're going to use to define success with your first dog, your second dog, your third dog, when you have this puppy, right? We always want to hope for more, right? Shoot for more, try and achieve more. But especially if you've had a lot of success, uh, like you have with Hobbs, it's, there's already really a high standard there, right? So Hobbs just wins his third national championship. You know, you've been alternate for the FCI Agility World Championship. You've been runner up at Westminster on TV. Uh, you know, you're a well-known instructor, seminar presenter, you're, you're in demand. And now you have this puppy. So how do you, like, what kind of expectations do you have? Did you have before? This is before Skeptic ever showed up in your house what kind of expectations you had? And then after the first week, what kind of expectations did you have? And then <laughs> now, two years later, right? Or a year and a half later, what kind of expectations do you have? So three, three phases of expectations. And I want to hear a little bit about all of them. So first, tell us before the dog ever showed up, what kind of expectations did you have? Oh, I, I guess I expected him to be a little bit more like Hobbs. Mm-hmm. And that he'd be, you know, pretty easy to train and focus and he'd want to work with me right away. And so I guess those were my my expectations. And then after we got him, boy, did they lower. <laughs> we right. had to just work on focus. And whenever we changed environments, oh, I had to really, really lower criteria because there were times where he just couldn't even focus at all. And this is like the first seven days, right? So after the first week right? You're like, oh my God, this is not what I was expecting. <laughs> exactly. Right? And so you had to change your expectations. I really like that. And I, I want to back up to what you were saying about expectations before, how you were expecting them, even though it's a different breed and a, a completely different dog, obviously you expect them to be like hops. Now I know that there are people out there who are like me, you have an affinity for a breed or, or you know, a particular breed. So let's say you only get Rottweilers, you only get Golden Retrievers, you only get Shelties, right? And it's even harder for people who do that to have expectations that are not based on what they've already had, right? Because (laughs) it's so obvious, especially like, let's say you have a dog and you breed that dog and you keep a puppy from your own litter, right? You probably have even more expectations tied to what you know about the behaviors and accomplishments of dogs you already had, right? Yes. So it's really, really a difficult thing. And it's so interesting to um, hear you say that, uh, when we were getting this dog, and so the new puppy that we got for people who don't know at this point, her name is Emma, and she's a poodle, and she's 13 weeks old now. And um, t- to me, and talking with Sarah Baker, she sounds a little bit like skeptic, but not as uh, skeptic-y? Not, <laughs> not as skeptical. Not as skeptical. That's a good one. Uh, yeah, so I, my dog is quite skeptical. You, you guys can start saying that. I'm a skeptical puppy. And so in terms of expectations, because she was our first poodle, right? And I had done all this research. I had talked with so many different poodle owners and handlers and trainers uh, in agility, outside of agility. And I still didn't know what to expect. 
right? So it's a little bit uh, different for me. You know, I kind of held my expectations at bay this one time, you know, but obviously in the past, Mm -hmm. like when we got in a border collie and and things like that, you had uh, certain expectations. And so it's interesting to hear you uh, talk about that. Okay, so that was after one week. And then now you're talking about uh, almost two years old, you know, it's almost two years later. So how have your expectations expectations change you initially lowered them now where you where are you on this skeptic well as the two years went they continued to just be lowered uh, or be lower than than they were with hops Mm -hmm. Um, and when we first started trialing too he had much lower criteria my criteria was just play with me just stay in the game and and that was it (laughs) Now, though, he has, has kind of switched with trialing where he loves it. So we've drastically raised criteria at trials, and I have raised my expectations. Um, and now I, I, I do have much higher expectations because he's showing that he's very, very capable and very talented. Right. And I think here we, are, we have just heard puppy tip number one for all of you. I think this applies to all of dog training, but in particular to people who are working with puppies, you're working with a new dog, just getting started in agility and it's to adjust, right? You need to adjust to your dog. It starts with adjusting your expectations and then you can also adjust your training. And one of the things that I want to hear about is uh, more about this idea of criteria because you're talking about lowering criteria and that doesn't seem like something that people would do right away or think to do right away. So what kind of, like, what's a common way to lower criteria for skeptic if you're uh, working on something? Well, I'll give you an example, like uh, take healing. So in the house, when he was a puppy, we were working on healing, he could do it in the yard, and then we would take it to puppy class. And puppy class, we would go out to do a healing demo, and he couldn't even look at me. There was zero focus. So instead of having the criteria of actual healing, my criteria at first was just orienting toward me, just not pulling opposite of me. And I would click and treat that. And so I'd have super, super low criteria that really wasn't healing at all. It was just, just not doing the things I didn't want him to do, pulling in and sniffing and things. So when he'd orient toward me, I'd click and treat. Then when he would do that a few times, I would raise criteria where he maybe actually had to take a step toward me or look at me, and then build on that until I actually had him healing by my side again. And usually you can raise criteria faster than you could when you initially taught the behavior. Mm -hmm. But healing, I think, is a good example there. That's a beautiful illustration. And so for those of you out there, you're seeing people post on social media all the stuff that they're doing with their puppies. Uh, the puppy, the puppy owners are probably not posting what Sarah Baker just <laughs> described to you, and that is absolutely critical. And without that information, I would have really struggled psychologically. Through, I'm telling you now, through these first two two and a half weeks, right? I would not <laughs> have made it because um, she would be this poodle. Emma would be brilliant. We have like a little working area in the garage, laid down some turf, got all her toys and stuff out there, and you know you could put a box out there, you could put something for her to put her paw in, and she would get it. She would get on her bed. She, famously, like poodles are, are noted for having that high intelligence, figuring things out. Once she figured it out, boom, she would be doing it, right? And then I would try and do things like uh, move it to a different part of the house where the other dogs are a couple of feet away, you know, in a different gated area or an X pen or something like that or in a crate. And suddenly she couldn't do it, right? Yep. And so that's, I think, where people are like, oh, come on, you know this, right? Which is not the right way to think about this. And um, they fail to adjust. And so I really like your story. And I really want to emphasize it here because you are going to run into this. And it happens with people in just regular agility. How many of you have dogs that can weave at home, that they, they can weave in practice, and then you get to a trial and they do everything okay and they can't get the weaves right? Okay, weaving is a very complex behavior. And so they, they're telling you that they can't do it in that environment and in that setting. And so somehow we got to go back and repair the behavior chain, right? Agility is just a big behavior chain. And so I love all the work that you were doing with Skeptic because you're doing it with behaviors that are not agility at all or not agility yet. Hand touches, uh, eye contact, things like that. 
and you know they're going to struggle away from home. You know they're going to struggle in new environments with other dogs around, with barking in the background, with uh, traffic zooming by, right? And then you're working up to the point where he can do those things, where some of those environmental sensitivities don't bother him. And it all happens before he ever shows up for a trial. Even then, with all the work that you did, you are telling us that you lowered your criteria even for his first trial. So can you tell us a way that you kind of lowered your criteria that's uh, trial specific, like when you were getting ready for that first trial, what was, what was something you were thinking about? Well, part of it was, was my plan of what to do if things did not go correctly. Mm -hmm. So if he broke a start line, I would planned to just let him run. If he ran around a jump, I was not going to take him back to it. I just wanted to let him just keep running. Missed a contact, just keep running. Uh, versus hops had higher criteria. Mm -hmm. um, if you broke a start line, you weren't going to get to do your run because I knew he could handle it and he wanted to run from day one. Skeptic, I just wanted to make sure that he had fun and really wanted to play the game with me. Yeah, I'm very much in the camp of hope for the best. But prepare for the worst. And I <laughs> see so many people, they're really un unprepared. They really look surprised. Uh, no matter how well your dog does in, in practice, especially if you've not been putting them in those trial situations, um, you know, ex expect things to possibly go haywire. And you need to be right there with a quick response to kind of condition the behaviors that you want, right? Reinforce what you want, that sort of thing. Yes. Um, the tip number two, which you just talked about, was how you quickly progress through the skills again, like you went through the progression, right? So let's say he had learned some behavior in a quiet location, he mm -hmm. went to the new place, he's totally blowing you off. You say, okay, we can't do that. We can't do that right now. It's ridiculous. And you don't get upset about it. You say, okay, just look at me, buddy. I'm going to click and treat that. Okay, now you're looking at me. Okay, now, let, now let's see if you can do a little bit more. And then you quickly run him from the ground up. So something that maybe took you three or four sessions, you do it right there in one session, a couple reps at each phase. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So that's a great tip that you're getting here from Sarah Baker. That's uh, tip number two. And I think the emotions here really cannot be overlooked. The emotions by the handler. I think there's such a feeling of uh, disaster has happened when the dog doesn't do something that you expected them to be able to do, or when they have some behavior that you really don't want to see. Maybe they look fearful or frightened or um, overwhelmed by their environment. And it is so easy as the handler to just feel like this puppy is broken. <laughs> like I've already broken this puppy and there's no coming back ever, right? right. I might as well start looking for my next puppy. And <laughs> I think um, one thing that, that Esteban mentioned just now was when things go wrong, like you don't get mad. And I think, or, you know, I would add or frustrated. And I think that is so hard, but so key because the response that you give your dog in that moment is so important to how they view coming back from, from that environment or that mistake or uh, how fast they go through this, pro prog uh, this progress that you're doing going back from the beginning. Absolutely. And, and I see it in, in class all the time where a dog will make a mistake, oftentimes because the handler lumped criteria versus mm -hmm. breaking it into small pieces. But when the handler responds with frustration, some dogs will get, immediately get sat and they will slow down or they'll go sniff, and other dogs will take that opportunity to go zoom around the, the arena. So our emotions are definitely important and have a plan to recover from mistakes. Um, when I work with people's dogs, a mistake happens, and I just ha either happily tell them, what a good try, let's try it again, or they get a hand touch request and then a cookie for that, and then we try again. And the dogs much more eagerly stay in the game with me because I have that contingency plan for mistakes. And I keep that level head versus having an emotional response to the dog's behaviors. And I think that that goes back to another aspect of expectations. So when we first talked about expectations, it was kind of like this big global, what are your expectations for skeptic? You know, what do you expect out of him over his career or how he's going to do or how he's going to be? But I think there's another level of expectation, which is what can you expect from any 10 week old puppy? Because unless you you know, just got a puppy six months ago, you've probably forgotten. Mm -hmm. 
And people joke about it all the time. I think people who have puppies always joke, yeah, it's been six years since I last had a puppy. And that's probably because if I remembered it was this hard, I wouldn't get one. You yes. know, it's like, <laughs> it, it, so um, when you actually get that little puppy, it is so easy to think that they are capable of more than what they truly are capable of. Absolutely. And yeah, I, that, that was really nice for me to uh, edit Sarah's videos because then I had uh, a good basis for uh, comparison. And then I'm like, oh, okay, so this is what's reasonable. This they can reasonably do. And so when my puppy, uh, you know, wasn't doing what I thought she could, you, you could you could tap the brakes a little bit and say, hey, you know, that's not. That's not reasonable for that age. I don't know what you're expecting, but your dog certainly can't run out there and start weaving at 13 weeks old. Right. Well, and yeah, and each dog has their own strengths. So, like Hops learned to do perch work, you know, pivot around a, a perch really quickly, but he struggled a little bit to learn to circle a cone. Skeptic learned to circle a cone in one session, but it took him like six months to learn the pivot work. <laughs> Right, right, exactly. And I think, um, you know, you mentioned lumping criteria, and I think that that is a huge issue that the majority of handlers have. And I think it's because many, many dogs let you get away with it. And so you begin to think that that is, um, that's the expectation when really that shouldn't be the expectation. If your dog is letting you get away with kind of lumping things together, like, Good for you and good for that dog, but you can't use that to hold that against a puppy that needs a more structured approach to learning. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I'll give you some examples. So one of the things that we have uh, in puppy training is teaching the dog to touch or get on or put certain feet on all kinds of different objects, right? And at some point, after a couple of sessions of this, me as the handler, me as the trainer, right? I put an object, if I sit down on the ground, right, with my legs crossed, and in front of me, I lay down an object, it is obvious to me, I want the dog to interact with that object, okay? And so maybe I, the first click I'm waiting for is the dog to show some kind of interest in the object, right? But when you first put the dog down, maybe the puppies, they want to crawl in your lap, they want to bite your pants, they want to, <laughs> you know, uh, lick your face and, and um, do these things. And so in the beginning, I found that I was waiting uh, too long for them to orient d directly on that thing. And um, I think w one tip that I would give is you can start clicking right away and then just eventually get them there. So, okay, maybe don't jump up and, and paw at my face. Okay. And now if you happen to look away from me, that's a great one. They just happen to look away from you and click and then reward away from you. Extend your arm away from you and towards whatever object you want them to interact with and then click again there and then you can get them started. It's like your first couple of clicks are almost throwaway clicks. You feel like you're not shaping the behavior, but really, yeah, it's the first couple of super early steps. Same thing for a dog coming to you. Let's say you put the dog down and the dog like is zooming around the place or not even zooming. They're just walking around exploring the place and you're like really tempted to, uh, to call them over. You know, and you're like, hey, come over here. And now let's start. The clicker session starts when you give me that first thing that I can click. Well, the first thing that you can click is when they're all wandering around. They're wandering around five feet away and they turn and they look at you. Boom. I click and then I want to reward right at wherever that object is. Right. And then they got to come all the way there. They're going to be now they're going to be really close to the object. And boom, you can click again for them being in proximity to the object. There's several different paths you can take toward eventually getting there. Uh, but what I'm saying is that idea, just this idea of getting started that people are uh, struggling with. No, I know what it was. It was the lumping and splitting, right? If you lump things together, and for those of you who don't know what that means, it just means that you're expecting too much all at once. You hand a kid a basketball and you're like, go dunk the basketball. And they're like, what? How do I do that? Right? But like I think, you want to think... split it and you want to break it down into parts, show them the footwork, show them how to hold the ball, how to jump. 
then they can start taking some shots. Well, I think everybody has heard lumping versus splitting. And I think that the extreme example of giving a kid and having them dunk um, is actually a little less useful than let's take a real dog agility example, because I think sometimes people think that they're splitting, but they're not splitting enough. So, you know, I, when we were first taking Emma out and we were doing some just following work, just have her follow you. And so many puppies will just do that. You just walk around and they're going to follow right along because they're social animals. They want to see you and be next to you and you start rewarding it. And so I was really thinking of this as uh, step one is, you know, I walk and and you follow, like it just happens. And and I'm just rewarding it to um, make it more formal or something like that. But I put Emma down and I walked away and Emma's like, oh, look, the world, <laughs> you know, and she didn't follow at all. She's, it, she turned out to be a little bit more independent than uh, any dog that I'd worked with recently. And, um, you know, and this is, you know, we've only had her a couple of days, right? And so I'm like, well, I haven't, I haven't, made this happen in her yet. What do I do? And when I was looking at Sarah's stuff, it was like she was taking one little step and rewarding skeptic, one little step and rewarding skeptic. And she would give him help. She would call him. She would encourage him to come. And so I took Emma out the second time and I did it the Sarah Baker way. (laughs) And, And it was like magic. You know, it was like the the behavior that I was looking for was so much less than what I was expecting her to give me automatically, but with just a few clicks, suddenly now she is following me all around the yard. But I had to basically train that behavior. It didn't just come free. So I think that when we talk about lumping versus splitting, I think for a lot of people, it is splitting much more fine than you currently are. And I think that that goes a thousand times more for anything that you're struggling with. Like if you're not struggling with a skill, then maybe the level at which you have split things up is fine for you and that dog and that particular skill. But anything you're struggling with, you have to reevaluate the training plan and say, okay, I thought I was taking a small step. How can I make it even smaller? Absolutely. Great point. Uh, One thing I wanted to talk about was something that we all hear about because it ties directly to expectations that we have about the puppy. Uh, And it's this idea that your dog is a reflection of your ability as a trainer. I'm sure that's something that the majority of people listening have heard in some context or another. I think that phrase is uh, originally intended to help people think of themselves as uh, responsible for their dog's uh, uh, training and to go and actually train something and not just expect it from the dog. Um, but unfortunately, it, you know, I guess over the years, some people in some contexts have um, used this to kind of uh, be down on themselves and their own ability as a trainer. And, it, and it's really been uh, hurt, hurtful to their own dog training psychology, right? Because what, what happens is you get a dog like Skeptic. You get a dog like Emma. You get a dog that is basically struggling uh, compared to its peers. And perhaps before you got this dog, you thought of yourself as a pretty decent trainer. All right. And now you're, you're having these problems. Well, when you hear this phrase, your dog is a reflection of your ability as a trainer and this dog is struggling. What does that imply? Right. It implies you lack ability as a trainer. Right. That it is uh, your fault. Right. This is this turns into a, a blame situation. Right. And I think a lot of people fall into that trap. Um, they feel overly responsible. Right. So I think a more accurate statement would be your dog is a reflection of their genetics and biology, their environment, and your abilities as a trainer. That's what it's <laughs> right. But nobody wants to post that all over their Facebook wall. Um, but that's probably a more accurate reflection of, of what's going on here. Right. And I just want to give people out there uh, who are stuck in that rut that you're really down on yourself right now because your puppy or your dog is struggling um, because of this and and give you permission to recognize, right? That there are factors beyond your control. Okay. And some of them are intrinsic to the dog and some of them are intrinsic to environmental experiences that you cannot control. 
Okay. I can't control every dog that comes into my dog's space and those interactions. Obviously, I'm going to try and do that as best I can. Right. But if I'm running a course in a ring and some dog flies into the ring and attacks my dog, that wasn't something that I necessarily saw coming or could prevent. Right. So there are things that are going to happen that are beyond our control. And it's not all on our ability as a trainer. So that that statement is great for getting you motivated. It's great for beginner, novice trainers who tend to blame a lot on the dog and you know they don't have a lot of training skill yet. But for very experienced trainers who've been around uh, for a long time, that kind of saying isn't always motivational and it can be real psychologically damaging. Yeah, I think one other thing that I wanted to touch on was the idea that your dog struggling with something or or there being something that you need to work through um, is is not normal it 's absolutely normal it should be it should be you know going back to expectations it should be what you expect from your puppy. You should expect to hit snags you should expect to have to work through things you should expect for them to take backward steps. And so I think, you know, merging these two ideas together, what's normal and then your expectations, uh, it's really important to have that expectation that you're going to have these backward steps so that you can react to them appropriately and not give them more weight than what they deserve. Definitely. And right now I'm going through that with Skeptic with trialing. We started out not super focused and fast. I worked on the motivation and the drive and the speed. Now we have that. And because we have all this drive and speed now, we struggle with teeter stays and start lines. (laughs) So we've had to tweak our trialing plan and go to uh, trials that we could train. So we've done ASCA, USDAA, UKI, and we've been able to redo start lines, redo teeters, and we're starting to get those back again. Yeah, that's pretty interesting because if you haven't seen a video and maybe we can put a link to the show note in the show notes page, a link to a skeptic running skeptic is fast and skeptic is good. And skeptic is going to be a first big show is going to be a Julie world championship team USA tryouts. And that's in two or three weeks. Yes. Yeah, that's going to be his debut, right? (laughs) I start at nationals or, or, you know, a specialty show or a big uh, cluster dog show or something like that. But he's just going to jump right into tryouts. And, and he's tremendous. Well, let me ask you this, and we will make this tip number three. What are some signs, if you're working with a puppy, let's say any dog up to six months of age, you're trying to do something, whether it's a clicker session or a play session or whatever, what are some signs that the dog is just, they're done with that session? You know, they, they're mentally checked out. It's over. You should just stop. Oh, certainly leaving. <laughs> so if they are not staying engaged and they, they have left you, that's a pretty good that's sign. Such a big op- well, let, let me stop you right there. <laughs> when the dog leaves, like er- everybody hates to end on that. And I, I used to be in that camp. This is like, I don't know, 10 years ago where I'm like, okay, we can never end on a bad rep. Like if the dog's going to walk off, I have to get them back and they have to do this. Even if they do it like garbage, they'll have done it. You know, this jump, (laughs) this weave. I mean, like just do the weaves one time. I don't care if you do it slow and like garbage. We'll make the entry easier or whatever. Just to end on that. I no longer think like that. You know, if I hit that point and the dog lays down or they're done or whatever, one, I try to avoid that in the future Um, uh, and, you know, look for that threshold, that marker. But uh, yeah, I just, I just let it happen. So like with this puppy, the puppy wanders off. I'm like, all right, we're done. You know, I'm not trying to get that puppy back for uh, one more rep. Okay, but go ahead. Yeah. Go on, go on. Wandering, uh, wandering off. That's a huge one. Yeah, sniffing. Um, sometimes jumping up on you, uh, not wanting the food anymore. Um, mm, yes. For some dogs, when the food starts falling back out of their mouth, you are done with your training session. Yes, <laughs> right, right. yes, yes. Um, a good sign for hops is he can no longer sit. So if I want to run another sequence and I ask him for a sit stay and he just stands there or slowly starts to sit, we're like, okay, we are done. If you cannot sit for me, we're not going to run another sequence. Right. And of all the things that you said, I think the one that people aren't expecting is when the dog crawls up in your lap. So that's happened to us, right? The poodle will go and then she crawls up in your lap. She gets on your face and she starts kissing you. And like, it's really adorable type behaviors. But I think that can be a strong sign that people are missing, that the dog doesn't want to be there, uh, that they're mentally fried or or for whatever reason. 
one other thing that I noticed, you know, I was doing that, uh, what do they call it? Fit pods? Yeah, yeah. yeah the they're like these little half paw pods. Spheres, yes, yeah. Paw pods. Okay. And they got these little like rubber spikes. They're not sharp, but they got these little rubber spikes all over them, right? Mm-hmm. And the dogs can, and can step on it and you can do whatever you want to do, like pivot work and put four of them together and they can put one paw on each one. I think that's the ultimate, right? That people see in videos, mm-hmm. yeah. top trainers doing that, right? One paw on each pod, right? Which is a half sphere. And so we were doing that with the puppy and she would do a couple and then she just would wander off, right? And we we're in an X pen, you know, she can't wander off far and she just didn't want to do it. And then I thought, you know, she just doesn't feel very motivated right now. And I, I was almost going to just end the session. And then I thought, okay, you know what? What if it's those spiky things? And so I flipped it upside down so it can roll around. It's kind of at that point, like a, like a bougie board, like a, yes, yes, you know? exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, she just came in there and she was like touching every time, boom, Immediately boom, boom, engaged. boom, 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 and, and re-engaged. And I thought, oh, okay. You know what? In that case, the dog's not telling me, hey, I'm done working in general. The dog is just saying, I'm done with this particular thing. Like, I don't like something about this. My best guess is it was not comfortable for her. You know, when she puts her two paws on there, you know, she's so little and they kind of, her paws are like slip, the fingers of the toes are slipping in between the little spikes and it like stretches out her fingers funny for whatever reason, that's not comfortable, right? And she is letting you know, and that's one of the ways that a dog can let you know. So I would encourage people out there to respect it. And um, that would be like if you were lifting weights, right? And you're lifting heavy weights, but you're, you have a history of a wrist surgery or injury and your hand doesn't quite bend that way. And you have to do what I would call an alternate lift to exercise the same muscle, but in a different way. So it protects the angle that your hand is relative to your arm, your wrist, right? You lack wrist flexibility. As a trainer, would you tell that client, you know, I don't care if you're feeling discomfort, just one more, just one more. Like you wouldn't do that, (laughs) right? The client is able to verbalize to you, hey, you know, this is causing me discomfort. I'm not very comfortable with this. Can we do something else? Right. And so think about this puppy. Emma didn't have a way to say that, but that was her way of saying that, you know, she's going to crawl in my lap. She doesn't want to do it. She stops offering the behavior after offering it two or three times. Right. And so I thought that was a real big learning lesson for me. And it's not something that I would have thought about before, you know, watching you train skeptic has been very helpful in changing how I view the world. And I try much harder to view it from the puppy's perspective and to actually communicate uh, with the dog instead of it being one-sided, right? Communication can't just be me telling you what to do. Communication has to be two ways. And so I listen and observe to get back information from the puppy, right? That's great. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation on this podcast. Let me re, uh, re-summarize our uh, three tips here for you. And tip number one is to make adjustments, okay? Not just to your expectations, but within specific training sessions, you may have been looking to train one thing and end up training something else, okay? And and you want them to touch a, touch a box or get in a box or something, and now you have to just train and, and click and reward for them not going crazy and, you know, giving you some eye contact. Uh, tip number two is run through your progression. So you, you kind of taught something in one environment, you take them to a new environment, the behavior isn't there, it, it breaks down, start from the ground up and you can quickly take them through uh, their progression again. They'll do that very well. Tip number three, communicate with your dog, look for the signs. They're going to give you signs. Sarah talked about uh, uh, the big ones that you're going to see. They get up in your lap, they walk away, they refuse food. You know, suddenly they just don't want to do what they were doing uh, before. So take that as communication from your dog. Don't take it personally. Leave the emotion at home. And if you have a puppy right now or a young dog or a dog that you have just acquired for agility, uh, Sarah Baker's new online course, Agility Foundation for Puppies and Young Dogs, is open for registration. And we'll put a link to that on the show notes. This is uh, the progression of Skeptic from the day he came home till he was about six months old. It has 38 videos, six and a half hours of footage, and includes a lot of the progressions, the mistakes, and uh, working through those mistakes. And so we found it very helpful as we raise Emma and are excited to offer it through the Bad Dog Agility Academy. And thank you very much for joining us for this podcast, Sarah. You are very welcome. Thank you for having me.
And that's it for today's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsors, hititboard.com, 1TDC, and NTI Global. Tunnel bags and accessories. Keep your agility gear in place with these NTI agility items. Endless combinations of colors to choose from that match your vibrant tunnels. Visit shop.ntiglobal.com for the widest selection of dog agility tunnels for both competition and backyard training. Known for free shipping, more options, high quality products, and low prices, NTI Global has got you covered. Offering tamer and anchor weight bags along with a full line of accessories and agility storage solutions. Need your agility gear in a hurry? Don't forget to check the in-stock selection. Visit shop.ntiglobal.com and use promo code Tamer 19 bags for 5% savings off today. Promo code good through April 30th, 2019. Happy training.